with a message entitled Dark Before Dawn. What I want you to see is that there are two secret disciples who lovingly cared for Jesus' body as part of the gospel. There is one part of the gospel we don't talk about very much, and that's the burial. We rightly emphasize the crucifixion on Friday or Thursday, if that happens to be your perspective. And then we rightly emphasize the resurrection on Sunday morning. Those are certainly the emphasis in Scripture. It's a famous sermon preached on one occasion that said, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And so the emphasis on crucifixion and on resurrection is not wrong, it's right. That period between Friday and Sunday is kind of a spiritual no man's land. Just a waiting game until the action gets going on Sunday morning again. But the burial of Jesus is an important component of the gospel. Paul even mentioned the burial in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, in his concise definition of the gospel. He mentioned it as one of the elements of the gospel which I preach to you. This is the quote from verses 1 and 2. The gospel which I preach to you, by which also you are saved. And then he went on to say, that Christ died for us according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Our passage this morning, John 19, verses 38 to 42, deals with that burial and the two men who stuck their necks out to lovingly care for the body of their Savior. So who are those two men? They're identified by name. And there's a lot of information about them. We actually know quite a bit. The first is a guy named Joseph. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a rich man from a town called Arimathea. So most of us will refer to him as Joseph of Arimathea because there's a lot of Josephs. That was a city of the Jews in the hill country of Ephraim, according to Matthew 27 in verse 57. Some identify Arimathea with Rama of the Old Testament and think that Arimathea was probably the town where Samuel was born and which Samuel was buried. The verse goes on to identify Joseph as one who, quote, himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Matthew continues, noting that it was Joseph who went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus in verse 58, that he took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth in verse 59 and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. So it belonged, the tomb belonged to Joseph. And then Matthew, Matthew's account concludes by telling us that Joseph is the one who rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb. Now, he probably had help but it identifies Joseph as the one who was responsible for that. We learn a little bit more in the Gospel of Mark. We find out from Mark that Joseph was a prominent council member. Matthew doesn't mention that, but Mark does. And you say, council member? What kind of council member? When, when the Gospels talk about the council, they're talking about the Sanhedrin. So he was a prominent, not just one of the 70, a prominent member of the council of the Sanhedrin. And that he was, again, a, a quoting Mark, waiting for the kingdom of God. Mark 15, verse 43. Mark adds that he took courage to ask Pilate for the body of Jesus. In that same verse. That indicates that it wasn't easy. and That he had to work up the courage to go up to Pilate. And then Luke describes Joseph as, quote, a good and just man, in verse 50 of Luke 23. And then in the next verse, he says this, who had not consented to their decision indeed, and the they is the Sanhedrin. So somewhere along the line, the Sanhedrin got together and took a vote and said, how many of you think we ought to crucify Jesus? And most everybody raised their hand, but Joseph did not. When they said yes, Joseph said no. Luke also notes that no one had ever been laid in that tomb before. That goes along with the idea of it being a new tomb. 
But that's an important note. From our passage here, we're going to learn several things. Let me read it for you. It's, it's, it's uh, verses 38 through 42, Matthew chapter, pardon me, John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So in our passage, we learned that he was a disciple, but a secret disciple of Jesus. And that Joseph's tomb was in a nearby garden. Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in all four of the gospel accounts with respect to the burial. So he apparently took the lead in caring for Jesus' body. But there was another man, and you'll recognize this name. He was Nicodemus. Nicodemus is famous for his John 3 meeting in the nighttime hours with Jesus, early during Jesus' ministry. We find out from that passage that he was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. And while many of his colleagues were turning against Jesus, Nicodemus was curious. And he was investigating to learn more about this rabbi from Nazareth. So while all of them, not all of them, but most of them had a closed mind with regard to Jesus, Nicodemus had an open mind with regard to Jesus. What is this man teaching? Who is he? Where did he come from? What is he all about? Is this really the Messiah? In John 3, Jesus called him the teacher of Israel, indicating that he had a prominent teaching role possibly the prominent teaching role in the whole nation. To think of Nicodemus as the man upon whom Israel relied for their instruction from the word of God. Pretty powerful position, if that's what that passage means, and I think it may. Now Nicodemus shows up again in John 7, verses 50 and 52, where we learn that he was one of them, that is, he was also one of the Sanhedrin. That clarifies the ruler of the Jews comment in chapter 3. With respect to the burial of Jesus, only John mentions Nicodemus' role. Verse 39 tells us that it was the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. So it's not a different man by the same name. It's the same man. And that he supplied the spices used to prepare Jesus' body for burial. Verses 40 and 42, 40 through 42, tell us that Nicodemus worked with Joseph to apply the spices, to wrap the body in the linen cloths, and then to lay it in Joseph's new tomb. So these are the two men who took responsibility for Jesus' body, prepared it for burial, and laid it to rest prior to sundown on the day Jesus died. So I want to examine John's description of these two men and what they did to make this oft-neglected middle part of the gospel come to pass. John begins verse 38 with the recognition that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus. That is, he was a follower of this Galilean rabbi. Unlike most of his colleagues, he believed that Jesus was who he said he was. He had become a follower of Jesus. He believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He believed that he was a lo the long-awaited Messiah who had been prophesied. But his commitment up to this point was secret. He didn't want others to know that he was following Jesus. Now, the reason that he kept this secret is also found in verse 38. It says he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. The Jewish leadership had made it clear that anyone who confessed Jesus as Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. 
Remember back in John 9, if you can take your minds back 10 chapters, and you have the story of the man who was born blind, that Jesus gave him his sight back, the miraculous rest restoration of this man's sight, and the controversy that erupted over that, because Jesus had done this in a manner that made the Jewish leadership angry. And so they questioned the man, and then they drag his parents in because they don't believe that he was born blind. So they say, is this your son, and was he born blind? And they say, this, and how did he receive his sight? And they say, this is our son, we can tell you that. We can tell you he was born blind, but how he received his sight, we don't know. Ask him, he's old enough to talk for himself. And then John tells us that the reason they responded that way is because the Sanhedrin had said anybody who confesses Jesus as Messiah will be put out of the synagogue. And so fear of the Jews stopped them from going through and saying it was Jesus who did this. That amounted to being totally ostracized from Jewish society to be put out of the synagogue. For any Jew, that would be a devastating sentence. For a prominent Jew, one who is on the Sanhedrin, it would mean social and financial ruin. For a member of the Sanhedrin, it would mean social disgrace, loss of position, an abrupt end to everything that person had worked for and everyone that person had befriended and become part of their lives. It would be literally the end of life with the exception of the beating heart. I mean, everything about your life would be over. So we can look at this, and it's sometimes easy for us to do that. We can say Joseph was a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews and say, chicken, what's wrong with you? Shouldn't you have stood up? You can sit in judgment of Joseph for his silence, but I'd, I'd like to know what we would do faced with the loss of everything you held dear. Remember that the men who would be carrying out this sentence had been his friends and colleagues, likely, likely for years. So he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but he kept that belief to himself up until this moment. What about Nicodemus? Verse 38 only speaks of Joseph. However, we know that Nicodemus had pushed back against his colleagues back in John chapter 7. They were probably aware that he was at least on the fence with respect to Jesus. But as far as we know, Nicodemus was still a member of the Sanhedrin up to this point, so he was also likely a secret admirer of Jesus, if not a secret disciple. There's one other consideration with respect to this secret discipleship. As I noted, Luke tells us that Joseph had not consented to their decision indeed. When they decided to crucify Jesus, Joseph voted no. At that point, his secret was probably out. We don't know what happened to Joseph when he broke with his colleagues. Scripture doesn't tell us. But it's likely there were consequences. And if there were consequences when he voted no, those consequences would have been magnified when he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. The end of verse 38 tells us that Joseph asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. Now, uh, the point here is that their request was courageous. Before we get to that point, I just want to mention that typically the victim, victims of crucifixion were considered criminals. And Rome wasn't kind to criminals, either during their life or after their death. The point of crucifixion was to kill the victim, but to do so in the most humiliating and dragged out fashion possible, and in, in an order to deter anyone else from wanting to do this. And then remember, we talked about the little signs that they would put up on the cross, and that the point of the sign was to say, this guy stole from Rome. Want to try it? Here's what happens to you. Or whatever the crime might have been. So the Romans 
Usually, when a crucifixion finally resulted in the death of a person, which could be days, sometimes people hung on the cross alive for days. Once that person had died, they would leave the corpse on the cross and allow the birds and the wild animals to pick the corpse clean. I'm sorry, this is right before lunch. But that's what they would do. And then it was down to bones. They would dispose of the bones in a dump like the Valley of Hinnom. So it would be like throwing it in the back of a truck and taking it out in 94 and throwing it in a dump. Now, they weren't going to do that this time because of the approaching Sabbath. So it's likely they would have removed the bodies, dumped them in that valley, that dump, and covered them with sulfur to cover the smell of decomposition. In any event, they would not have considered burial. Burial was dignified. Burial was something you did for somebody you cared about and you loved. Burial was not something that was given typically to a person who was crucified. Now, the persons who might be interested in burying a crucified victim were family. And family could possibly come and request the body, but there was no guarantee that the Romans would give the body to the family. Once a person was convicted and taken to the cross, that person's body became Roman government property. And they could do with it whatever they wanted because from their perspective, again, the whole process was to deter other people from doing whatever this person supposedly had done. So there was no guarantee that the government would even give, that the Romans would give the, the body to the family. And here's Joseph coming up, and he is not a family member. And it's not that Jesus didn't have family members. His mom was on the, the ground in front of the cross. He had half-brothers and sisters. We know that Jude, Jude, the book of Jude in the Bible, that that was a half-brother of Jesus. We know that James, the book in the Bible, was a half-brother of Jesus. They weren't believers yet. They didn't come asking for the body. But Joseph did. He had no inherent right to the body, but he came and asked for it. He took courage, Mark 15, and approached Pilate to request that the body would be released to him. Now, that was no small matter. Because for Joseph, he would have exposed him to accusations of being aligned with Jesus and possibly put his life at risk with the Romans. If you go back to our thoughts on the trials, remember that the Romans, for the most part, looked, or, or not the Romans, but Pilate, for the most part, looked at Jesus and said, I don't know why you guys want me to do this. He's innocent. There's nothing here. There's no reason for us to crucify this man. But there was the charge of sedition, and there was the, the, the Jewish leadership trying to get Pilate to come up with some reason why he should be crucified. And so for a follower of Jesus to come and say, I'd like to take the body down, would immediately align that person with Jesus. And if there were people in the Roman government uh, structure who put that together, it could be potentially difficult or dangerous for Joseph. So he risked by approaching the Roman governor. And then there was the risk of the wrath of their colleagues. Even if the Romans weren't put off by his request, his friends and colleagues on the council most certainly would have been put off by Joseph doing this. As I said, burial was dignified. The people on the council wanted the body of Jesus to be handled in the most undignified manner possible. That's why they clamored for crucifixion. It wasn't just putting him on the cross. It was the whole nine yards, the whole mess that was a part of crucifixion. Plus, they were aware that Jesus had promised to rise again. And burying his body opened up that possibility. Joseph exposed his allegiance to Jesus with this request. So even if he had escaped their wrath when he voted no, he would certainly have incurred that wrath when he asked to bury Jesus' body. So it took courage on at least two fronts for Joseph to approach Pilate and carry out the burial of Jesus. 
Verse 39 is the first mention of Nicodemus in this passage. It doesn't mean he wasn't involved before this, but it looks like Joseph was the prime mover in all the events of verse 38. They were probably working together. I mean, it's evident that that they were working together, but from the beginning, the while Joseph is in verse 38 taking care of the legal matters, can I have the body? Yes, I'll get it down. Uh, Nicodemus was taking care of the logistics. So he's working on the spices and the cloth and the stuff that's going to be necessary to prepare the body for burial. Now, what these men did indicates that they were treating Jesus as the king he claimed to be. We don't see that right away just looking at the passage. But he was buried in a new tomb in which no one else had ever been laid. That was typical for a highly uh, placed person in society. You didn't place that person in a tomb along with a bunch of other bones. You carved out a new one, particularly for a king. And so that was something that they did. It was a garden tomb, which was also fitting for a king. And then the sheer volume of the spices that Nicodemus brought, it says 100 pounds in our text. That's that's a, a translation of the uh, uh, of the Roman concept that probably about 65 or 70 pounds in what we think of as American pounds. Still, a huge amount of spice, indicating that they were treating Jesus as royalty. One, one uh, commentator that I read said that the average run-of-the-mill Joe would be buried with about a pound of spice brought 65 to, do, to bury Jesus. It's many times more spice than was normally used for burial. So their purpose was noble. They cared for Jesus' body. Verse 39 indicates that Nicodemus also came. So he probably helped Joseph remove the body from the cross, which would not have been an easy task. If you've ever tried to lift someone who is asleep, even a child, right? If they're asleep, they're out. You try to pick them up, they're not helping you, right? They just are limp, and you've got to try to lift that person. Okay, let's take that to an adult, and this person is not on the ground, but elevated on a cross, and you've got to try to take the nails out, and you've got to try to bring this person off the cross, and the body's a mess. It would have been no easy task to do that. So he probably helped. Both men were wealthy and may have had servants with them to help with the heavy lifting. They're not mentioned here. That's speculation. Whenever I speculate, I I need to say that, that that's speculation, but I think it's probably reasonable. And it also says that he brought with him a mixture of myrrh and aloes, the spices often used to cover the smell of decay in Jewish burial customs. Now, we don't know exactly how they used those spices, but we do know that they took great pains to cover Jesus' body with many times more spice than was normal. And they honored Jewish custom to the best of their ability in the short time the men had available. They cared for Jesus' body according to custom. They weren't able to do everything the custom required. That's why the women were coming back on Sunday morning. They were planning to complete the burial process, but they treated Jesus' body with respect and buried him in the new tomb with as much honor as they could in the just a few hours they had available to them. Verses 41 and 42, I want you to notice that their action was sacrificial. First of all, Joseph sacrificed his tomb Joseph no doubt carved out this tomb for his own eventual burial. He was not thinking of Jesus when he prepared this burial place. He was thinking of his own time when he would pass. It was was also in a prime place near the city, so undoubtedly an expensive piece of real estate in ancient Judea. But Joseph gave it willingly to Jesus, so the tomb was his sacrificial gift along with the work of preparing the body for burial. And then the spices were costly. You know, we look at spices and we say, I can go to Walmart and pick up a 
jar of spice. Okay, you get a big 10 pound. What is that going to cost you? 10 bucks? It's estimated that the spices that Nicodemus brought could have been, in today's dollars, valued at somewhere in the neighborhood of $200,000. This was not cheap. This was not something that he just said, ah, throw a few things together and bring them over. That speaks to Nicodemus' wealth, but also speaks to his sacrifice. The amount of spices he brought rivaled what was used in the burial of Gamaliel, one of the most revered teachers in Israeli history. We don't know what Nicodemus was worth, but he likely used a great deal of his personal wealth to prepare the body of the Messiah for burial. There's one more thing to consider when you think about sacrifice. By handling a dead body so close to the Passover Sabbath, they made themselves ritually unclean. Remember, these are two observant Jews who are part of the Sanhedrin, so they're rulers of the Jews. One of them might have been the most prominent teacher of the Jews. Leaders of the people, and they were willing to lay aside one of the most important Jewish holidays in order to properly care for Jesus' body. Now, that may be lost on us, but that wasn't lost on them. They knew what this meant. You couldn't touch a dead body and then come and, and, and celebrate Passover. So we don't have holidays like that in the United States. And you, you have to do something like that. You wash your hands and clean up and you go celebrate the 4th of July or Labor Day or whatever it happens to be. Not this. You couldn't do that. So they made themselves ritually unclean. Now, as you look through that whole passage, they were likely unaware of the role they were playing, but it was significant. Burial signified death. Skeptics have often tried to say that Jesus didn't really die. One theory, called the swoon theory, suggests that Jesus never actually died on the cross, that he passed out. Proponents of that theory say he simply swooned and he was still alive and they put him in the tomb and later on the cool air of the tomb he revived. It's a fascinating theory. I wonder how he survived the spear to the side. I wonder how after having been crucified and beaten to within an inch of his life and speared in the side and out came blood and water that he was strong enough to roll the stone away. It's, it really is an amazing thing. People will try anything to get away from what the Bible says, to get away from the concept that Jesus, in fact, died. But by saying that, they think they've put the legend of the resurrection to rest because Jesus never really died. But the actions of Joseph and Nicodemus preparing a lifeless body for burial indicate otherwise, not to mention the Roman spear, and the centurion's certification to Pilate. Remember that Pilate, at first, when, when Joseph came and said, could I have the body of Jesus? Pilate said, he's dead already? I need to find out for sure. Calls in the centurion and says, is he already dead? The centurion says, I can guarantee you, he's dead. Now, we might say to, to ourselves, well, oh, that centurion might have been mistaken. He would not have allowed himself to be mistaken. Number one, Romans were masters. They were um, they were absolutely the best at making sure somebody was dead. Their job was killing Roman soldiers. They knew when somebody was still alive and when somebody was dead. Number two, as a Roman soldier, he knew if I certify this guy is dead and he's not, guess who gets to die in his place? So the centurion is going to know for sure that Jesus is dead. And then these two men buried him. And they didn't want Jesus to be dead, but they worked with his lifeless body to prepare it for burial. Then they laid it in the tomb. If there had been any inkling that Jesus was still living, if he was still breathing in any way, if they could have gotten a heartbeat, if there had been anything like that, they wouldn't have gone through the process. 
but they did. And because that all is true, we know that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried. And that's what paved the way for the amazing, glorious events of Sunday morning. So what they did was significant. It was important. You know, there's a couple of things that we do by way of ordinances today as churches, right? One of them is called baptism. Rider, you need to be baptized, right? We got to talk to your mom and dad about that because we need to get this done. Okay? Kobe, you just trusted Christ as your Savior. Baptism is the next step. So what, what we need to do is baptize. Now, when we baptize, we do it by immersion. There are other people who call, call baptism sprinkling or pouring or whatever. We do it by immersion, and there's a reason for that. The picture of baptism is the picture of the gospel. When a person stands in the baptismal waters, they are buried with Christ. They die and are buried with Christ in, in baptismal waters. Now, they don't actually die. Understand, this is a picture. But the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is pictured in baptism. There's another ordinance that we do, and it's called the Lord's Supper. And we say that we are going to remember the Lord's Supper till what? Till He comes. Well, if He's dead, He's not coming back. But if He rose from the dead, He is. So the concept of burial, the gospel, all those things are a part of what we do in our ordinances as well. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and then He rose again on the third day. Two men who had everything to lose and nothing to gain took action. This action was born of love. It was a love that had been hidden but blossomed into full view when they went to Pilate and said, can we take the body of Jesus and lovingly prepare it for burial? This action took courage. It took courage to deal with the Romans. The Jews were a subjugated people. The Romans had the rule. They had the power. They could do with you whatever they wanted. If they wanted you dead, you were dead. And so they took, it, they took their lives in their hands, literally, to go to Rome. And then it took even more courage to come out of the proverbial closet and proclaim, I, I hate to use that phrase anymore because it means something very specific in our culture, but they came out and proclaimed in no uncertain terms their allegiance to Jesus. This action likely severed old tides, ties, but also forged new ones. When they buried Jesus, these men left the old life with all of its perks behind. Old friends were gone. All that money that they had likely dried up. Comfortable old connections were broken, but they replaced those old connections with new ones. New friendships among the people of God who were committed to Jesus. And this action paved the way for Sunday morning. Without knowing it, these two men made necessary preparation for Jesus' resurrection. Isn't that interesting? They're, they're caring for a body, or caring for a body. And what God is doing is using them to prepare the body to be raised from the dead. They placed Jesus in a tomb, a tomb that would be empty by Sunday morning. Joseph and Nicodemus were part of the gospel story as they lovingly cared for Jesus' body. Their role involved the dark, the silent gloom of the grave. But it paved the way for dawn on Sunday morning. You know, sometimes we do things that seem as if they have no connection to anything profitable. I'm serving the Lord doesn't feel like it's of any value. Don't feel like anybody cares. In fact, it almost feels like most people would say, why are you doing that? That's silly. Don't do it. 
Don't waste your time. But when we honor the Lord Jesus in what we do, God has said that will bear fruit, even though we're not sure how. So when you have a gospel conversation with somebody, and it doesn't look like it went anywhere, you're doing what God wants you to do, and God will bear the fruit that He wants to bear out of that. You teach a Sunday school class. You work with children in VBS. You do things around the church that nobody sees. You come here and clean it on a, on a weekend. I told Jan that I, I uh, walked out of here on Friday night at 10 o'clock and came back and on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and somewhere in between there, somebody had cleaned the church. I don't know who did that. I don't know if it was the Jibias or who did it. Somebody did it. Because my office smelled better and all the trash was gone. When you do the right thing, when you take the right stand, when you be the right kind of person, you honor the Lord Jesus and God will bring fruit from your labor. That's one of the lessons, maybe the primary lesson, we learn from Joseph and Nicodemus. Do what God wants you to do. Do the right thing. Be the right person. Take courage and stand up. When others around you are, are, are shirking their responsibilities and maybe slinking away in fear, do the right thing. God will honor that. That's what happened with Joseph and Nicodemus, and that can happen with us as well. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for these two men. There was a time in their lives when they didn't want anybody to know that they were connected in any way to Jesus. But they eventually came to the point where they could not any longer hide it. And they did something that might have seemed mundane and beneath them to a lot of people. Wealthy people didn't prepare bodies for burial. Somebody else did that for them. But these two men stepped up. And because they did, that middle component of the gospel took place. Thank you for what we learned from them in this passage. It's one of those portions of Scripture we sometimes just kind of brush by because we're anxious to get from the cross to the empty tomb. But before the tomb could be empty, it had to be filled. And these men took care of that part of the gospel. We're grateful for that. Teach us from that. Help us to recognize that there are no inconsequential uh, points of obedience. That when we ob obey, when we do what we know we're supposed to do, when we honor God with the decisions we make in our lives, those decisions have meaning and have merit. And we're grateful for that. Teach us to be people who obey. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of verse.